Okay, let's start our advanced beekeeping class with a word of prayer, shall we? Oh Lord, most holy Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to be inspired, to hear from your word, words of hope, encouragement that we would faint not, that we would uh, go home with a new desire, a new submission to you to work in our hearts and in the plan that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, how many of you are at this class and you haven't been to any of the other beekeeping classes? Okay. <laughs> so uh, we're going to do something a little bit different in this, in this class, the advanced beekeeping. I'm not going to get into a lot of really nitty gritty details because I have a bunch of things that I just want to, like seeds to sow in your brain for you to just kind of ruminate on. So if, if you're going to get into beekeeping, these are things that you just kind of want on the back burner just to think about, read about, and learn about for a few years down the road when you're comfortable with your own bees, you're able to get them through the winter and, and start developing a little bit of, okay, I think I understand a little bit about what's going on here. And now let's take some baby steps into some more maybe advanced um, techniques and uh, various things. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of different, just completely unrelated ideas. And then at the end, um, let's save our questions for the end and we'll try to do that all in one fell swoop. So the, uh, the first subject that as an advanced beekeeper you, you really need to learn how to do, and that is grafting and cell building. So what is grafting? Grafting is a method of being able to reproduce queens. So when you want to expand your apiary, there's two ways of doing it. You could expand your apiary by, by letting your hives go into swarming mode. And then you could harvest those swarm cells. If you were here in the other classes, harvest those swarm cells. Remember I mentioned about splitting hives? So you get three or four frames in one hive that has a swarm cell. All you need is actually one, although it's nice to have about two. Um, take out one of those frames that has a swarm cell on it and another couple of frames with some brood and uh, some honey and make those its own little hive and build it up from there. The problem with, with doing this uh, uh, apiary expansion with swarm cells, you're inadvertently sw um, selecting genetics that are swarmy. See what I mean? There, there are some races of honeybees that tend to be more swarmy than others. And you don't want your bees all just flying off everywhere all the time. So you kind of want to breed that tree, trait out of them. So you don't, you don't expand your apiary by selecting that, that, uh, that process. So, so what we want to look for is as we you know, get a few hives in our apiary, we want to look for especially the one that overwinters well, the one that builds up well, the one that produces well, and it would be nice if it had a nice temperament. Um, like I said, I've had one really ornery hive uh, quite a number of years ago, back in the days when it, I just had like a dozen or so hives and I would name them, and the mean hive I named Jezebel. Uh, and I, I took it up to my in-laws and I put another hive uh, right next to it, and and after uh, a season or so, that other hive got cranky too. Uh, eventually, it died out, and that was fine with me because I didn't want to reproduce that genetics. You you can if you've got a mean hive, you can take the queen out of that hive and squish her, and introduce uh, a queen into that hive with good genetics, and she will start laying those good genetic eggs and the, and the temperament over the hive over the course of a few months will completely change. Um, but you still have the drones from that cranky queen that are going to go out and uh, pollinate 
the other queens out there, and they're going to come back, and so they're going to kind of keep that, uh, that ornery gene alive. But what we want to be able to do is, is approach this reproduction thing of developing more hives a little more systematically. And one of the best videos that I've found on this, this grafting process and uh, uh, producing queens is Bob Binney's uh, YouTube channel on how we produce queens. Really a good, straightforward, very simple method of doing queens. And essentially what we're doing when we graft is we're making queen cells. Um, some people use, make little wax cups. Some people, you can buy these little tiny plastic cups and put them in a specialized frame. And then you're taking a little tool and you're getting down you got to have really good magnifier glasses to do this. You're basically, in a nutshell, taking a little tool and you're going down and then you're scooping up a one-day-old larvae. Now, remember from the picture yesterday how big those are. They're very, very tiny, but you get down in there and just scoop up that larvae, a regular fertilized um, worker bee larvae at one day old. We're scooping that up and we're putting it in the queen cell. And we're going to do like... 40 of those queen cells on this specialized frame, and we're going to put it in a, a beehive that we've uh, manipulated and managed. So it's got just overcrowded with worker, young worker bees. The young worker bees are the ones that are the nurse bees. And then we take away their queen. And so we're doing several things at once. We're freaking them out because they have no queen, and they scream and yell. But then they look over here, and there's like, OK, angel music all of these queens. <laughs> and so they start taking care of, of them all and developing them all into queens. So they will, they will feed them a whole bunch of royal jelly, which will develop them into queens. And they'll seal those cells. And when those, seal, those cells are sealed, it's very like clockwork. It's, it's very predictable the time when you, you graph them to the time that they're going to hatch out. So you raise them to like about a day or two before they hatch out, and then you harvest them. You pull them out and separate them all and put them in small nuke box hives that you've already separated all your hives into these small uh, units without queens, and then you put the queen cell in there. So what you've created is you've taken a bunch of full hives, cut them down, into just a few frames, put them off by themselves. They don't have a queen. They start chewing their fingernails up their elbows. <laughs> and they, you know, they're because they're panicking. They don't have a queen. They don't have eggs to lay a queen. But then all of a sudden, a queen cell shows up. And they're like, oh, a queen cell. Baby it. Take care of it until she hatches, which is like the next day or the day after. And then there they've got their queen. So grafting and cell building, there's quite a process to it. Don't don't do it you know, as a beginner, but it's just something to think about and watch videos on so you kind of know what's coming. Uh, I talked a little bit about this uh, last time. So disease and, uh, and wax moth control of stored equipment. So there's a, there's a wax moth, and it's about twice as big as a regular pantry moth. You know, the little guys that get in, your, in, the, in the stuff in your pantry and just kind of ruin everything. A wax moth is much bigger, and it will get into the foundation, the drawn comb foundation of your stored equipment, and it'll just eat it all up to bits and pieces and completely ruin it. And that can be a lot of money over time, and especially when you've got this much equipment. It's a big deal. So one of the best ways to control the wax moth is by freezing your equipment. Well, you know, none of us have a walk-in freezer that we can store. I mean, even, even a single box. How many of you right now could fit one of these single deep boxes in your freezer? <laughs> yeah, not many of us. So, um, but that's usually the best way to, as far as I've found, because I don't want to use mothballs in my stored equipment. I just think that's wrong, because that's pretty toxic. Uh, organic chemistry going on there with uh, paradichlorobenzene. That's what mothballs are. So what I'll do is during the winter, 
when the when the the prediction is there's going to be less than freezing weather for several days or at least several nights, I will take all my stored equipment. So this picture here is is all my honey supers, the shallower boxes that go on top, and there are some there are there are some deeps in there too that just uh, I, I don't have uh, beehives for. So I will stack it kind of crisscross so that a lot of air can get through there and I'll, I just leave it out for a couple of days in the really cold weather and it's going to freeze any of those uh, larvae, the, the pupae of the wax moth or the actual wax moth or the worm. Or, so it's just going to freeze it and then I can bring it all back in and I know, okay, now I'm pretty much clean. And that has really helped as far as controlling the, the wax moth. Uh, so the question is, how long do you have to freeze those? At minimum, as long as it's thoroughly frozen to the core, um, just overnight. Oh, you just got to freeze that. You know, how long, how long do you need to, to freeze a basil before you ruin it? One tiny little frost is all it takes, and it's dead, gone forever. Um, so that's something, you know, to keep in mind about storing equipment. Also we have found in beekeeping that freezing your equipment where you have a die out, maybe it's a die out because of chalk brood or sack brood, or maybe, uh, oh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, nosema, which is a disease they often get in the winter time, basically causes dysentery in the bees and then they just, they don't do well after that. But freezing your equipment for several days often will reduce the, the bacterial load so that when you reuse that that uh, that hive, if you may you may even have to clean up all the little wax, take all the old wax up and put new wax foundation in, and bring it back into service and put new bees in it. It helps to have had that that uh, that hive frozen for a day or two, and that really reduces the disease load. So you can put it back into service, and the bees will do okay. They will clean it up inside and go from there. Another thing that I've worked towards, so you can, and, and this was a question from uh, yesterday, how many hives can you have in any one given area? Well, it depends. It depends on what is the landscape out there around you. What is there for bee forage out in your landscape? If you, you know, if you live in the middle of 9,000 acres of um, alfalfa, let's say, there is going to be a short window of time when that alfalfa is blooming, and they're going to go crazy and be able to feed on that alfalfa. But once it's done, then there's nothing except maybe a few roadside dandelions. You get what I'm saying? So that's not going to be a good habitat, and maybe. Maybe there's enough along the roadsides plus the alfalfa that maybe a hive or two could survive on. But really, you need an area that has really good diversity. And bees are capable of traveling out uh, two, two and a half miles to forage. So, you know, you think about it. You've got about a five-mile circle around wherever you've got your beehive that, that is a potential forage material. And you know, and, and if so, if you're in an area that's got some good crops, it's got a lot of wild forage, uh, pasturage that has white clover in it, you know, a, a cow pasture, horse pasture, oftentimes they've got lots of uh, white clover, and that white clover has a very extended season. And then there's, maybe there's some fruit trees, maybe there's some wild area, some logged off area, like in our area, uh, when, they, when they do uh, logging. Lots of wildflowers come up for the first couple of years before the trees are big enough to crowd all the wildflowers out. There's some really good forage. We've got just tons and tons of blackberries in our area. So that is a really big crop. Uh, so when you've got an area that's got a real diverse landscape, you know, you can potentially have, in, in a natural setting, you can have 20 hives, 30 hives in one given area. Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna save that for later. So what I've done, 
because, you know, I'm getting to the point where, you know, I've got enough equipment for 60 hives. So that's kind of what I'm working towards is filling those 60 hives plus a bunch of smaller hive um, set up and just those, those little nuke boxes, kind of miniature hives. So what I would like to do is be able to, to have all 60 hives going into winter plus maybe 10 or 20 nuke box hives because I know I'm going to have some die outs. You always do. And whoever dies out in the winter, I've got those extra nuke boxes come springtime, and maybe there's a few nukes that have died out, but you see what I'm saying? I can take that empty hive that has died out, clean it out, and I can take one of my nukes and drop it into it, and now I've continued with my 60 hives. If I've got extra nukes and it's like they're expanding and they want to get into something, I can simply combine, if I've got all 60 hives going strong, I can combine that nuke with one of the other hives. Um, there are several ways of doing that. If, if, if one of my small nuke boxes, which I can't expand very well be just because of its size, if it's got a reasonably good queen that maybe is performing really well, I might choose one of my other hives that's not producing quite as well. It's got a queen, it's going okay, but it's just kind of, yeah, mediocre. I'll kill that queen and I'll combine using the newspaper method. And, uh, and that really boosts the population like right now of that hive. Uh, so anyway, what I'm getting to is I, will, I won't pollinate. I don't do the pollination circuit, but I do in the spring and throughout the summer I will put my bees out in about four or five other places. I send some bees up to my in-laws just because they like the pollinating on their garden and their, their little fruit trees. Um, I've got a friend, actually Nathan, Nathan Hyde that's been wandering around here. I put some bees typically at his place. I kind of staged them there actually. Uh, bees that I get new from somewhere else. Um, new swarms, or I extract them out of a, a building or something, I will typically take them to his place as kind of a quarantine, and I just watch them for the first season and make sure they're treated, make sure they don't have, to have any horrible diseases before I actually bring them home. So when you start moving around that many hives, you really quickly realize this, number one, it takes two people to move those hives because they're so heavy. You just can't do it on your own. And when you're moving them, typically you're moving them at night or in the early morning before the bees have ever come out of that hive. You want them all in and then move them. So what I've gone to, to moving after doing this is like, hey, Jeannie, can you help me? No, she's busy. She's tired. And it's, you know, you can only kind of push so much on your spouse. <laughs> no, I don't. Why? How did you get so many bees? <laughs> um, so, you know, then it's my nephew who's kind of living out in the woods behind us. Uh, but, uh, you know, our friends or family, whatever. And uh, it's a pain because you're always dependent on somebody else. So what I went to doing is putting two hives like this on a single base. And I developed, and uh, because I can do welding and, and metal work, I developed this boom system on the back of my truck, and I've got right up here just a little $69 ATV Harbor Freight uh, winch that, uh, you know, and it's a remote control, so you got the little clicker. I've taped the little clicker, and it's got the cable running down there, you see, and basically it's a little tiny forklift. So I can swing that around. And because I've created the base of this almost like a pallet, so it's kind of like half of a pallet, I come in beside or, 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 excuse me, behind or in front, and I just bring that in and then just lift them up and then swing them around doop, right in the back of the truck. And in that way, I've got a to Toyota Tacoma. I can hold eight hives in the back of my truck. And it's just really tidy. It's really easy. And you can do it by yourself and not bug, bug anybody else. That's really handy. Uh, 
I patterned this off of, and, and I'll give you re the reference on, on my last slide here, but uh, one of the other guys that I watch a lot of his videos is, is a Canadian beekeeper blog. Uh, uh, again, I'll show you. On the last slide, I'll have a whole bunch of references. You can take a picture of that slide if you like. But he's got big, like big flatbed delivery trucks, and he's got a boom like this, professionally made, and it will reach out like 16 feet. And, and he can stack up, you know, I don't know, several hundred hives on the back of his big truck. And uh, that's where I got the idea. A lot of guys that are moving hives around, they'll typically have four hives on a pallet. The Canadian guy does two hives uh, per base or pallet. And just because of my size, it would just be too awkward, too difficult to do the four, so I'm doing the two, and that's manageable. Uh, for the system that I built. So being able to move them around, think about that. So as you expand your apiary, um, how are you going to move them around if you want to, you know, put some hives in different areas out away from your own kind of home territory? The nice thing about having the hives in different areas is every area will give you a slightly different kind of honey. So it's kind of nice. You can. As, you, as a beekeeper, you can become, like I said, connoisseurs of fine honey, keep the different varieties separate, and it's just, you know, something fun to do. So, the next subject I want to talk about is making comb honey. How many of you have had comb honey? It's just really a nice treat, isn't it? It's nothing you're going to eat, like, all the time, but good, clean comb honey is not only fun to eat on occasion, but it is also another form of honey to sell at the farmer's market. You've got extracted honey, and you, you know, you think about what you can sell. You can sell beeswax, you can sell propolis, you could, royal jellies are really, that's a pain to do. Um, so it's not really a viable crop, but pollen, you can get pollen from your hives, and honey, you can do uh, extracted honey, you can do whipped, or what's called creamed honey. That's a little bit of a technique to learn how to do that. And you can do comb honey. There's an advantage in, in having lots of different kinds of honey and lots of different sizes, for instance, of extracted honey, because then you become almost like a competitor against yourself. And I've watched this because, like, I really enjoy minds of people. and. Uh, like learning what makes people tick. And I watch people at farmer's market. Um, are we doing good for time here? Yeah. OK, so a real quick story. So there's me and another guy that does farmer's market that sell honey. And I watch people. Now, 80% of the clientele of farmer's market are male or female? Female, yes. And a whole bunch, uh, a large percent of them have kids. And there's, and there's a whole gradient. There's, the, there's the, the, the mom that comes in. She just knows what she wants to get. She comes in, and she gets it, and she takes it out. And then there's the person that's just there to see everything, and sometimes they want to buy a little bit from every farmer uh, just to support the community. And then there's the romantics that come in, and they've got the basket. They've got the wick, or wicker or whatever. And, and it's over their arm, and, and, and their country, and they're just, it's, it's just this whole experience they've immersed themselves in, but I watch people. Okay, so they come in, and the other guy, he's at the very end of the, of the farmer's market row, and he comes in. He's got quart jars of honey, he's got pint jars of honey, and he's got honey sticks. Okay, um, 25 cents each, or five for a dollar. And when I see the little family come in, what do the kids do? They see the honey sticks, and they're like, vroom. <laughs> and they're like, mom, 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 honey sticks. And she's like, OK, here's a few you know, quarters. Go buy some honey sticks. Here's a dollar. That's his draw, OK? The kids are the draw. They bring mom over, and then she says, well, do I want honey? OK, so I've got quarts and pints there. And you know she might buy a quarter or a pint. 
And so I'm watching this, and I'm calculating this, and I'm like a leopard in the grass, you know, just <laughs> watching my prey. Because I've got some psychology going here. What I'm doing is I've got honey in quart jars, and I've got honey in quart uh, embossed plastic. It's got the little honeycomb on the jar. Some people like only glass. Some people don't care. They don't care. Um, containers are about the same price, but I'm competing with myself. If you want glass, oh, I've got glass. If you don't care, you want plastic, okay, I've got plastic. I've got everything you want. And then I've got like two pound daddy bears. I've got 12 ounce mommy bears. I've got the two ounce little baby bears. <laughs> and then I have a one pound container. And then I've got the four inch square comb. And that's, that's, okay, that's a big display, right? And so what happens is mom and the kids are eating their honey sticks and they come down. Mom spies the little two ounce baby bears and what happens? <laughs> and immediately, I, the hand is going for the money, and she's just walking right over, and it's like, come on, <laughs> I've, I've got you. <laughs> and then it's, you know, because she wants to buy the little two-ounce baby bear for the office, for the purse, or whatever, and it's just cute. It's like a number 10 on the cute. And, and you women are predictable. <laughs> <laughs> But now that you're there, it's like it, the question changes from do I want honey or don't I want honey? The question becomes which one do I want? And you see, I've, I've done that purposefully by having lots of different sizes. I don't want your question to be do I want honey or not? I want it to be which one do I want? You see the, <laughs> the fun thing there. Okay, so. That was an introdu introduction to good comb honey. The, the way to produce good comb honey, and there's lots of different methods that are a lot of work, but what I have found is this. You're, you're well into the spring. You see how much stuff is blooming. Everything is blooming, so we're on a good flow. Honey is coming in fast. I will take a good strong hive like this. I've got two deep boxes. I might have a medium super or maybe two supers on that. And, and they're just going like gangbusters. They're doing really well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the mediums, and I'm going to loan, I'm going to shake all the bees out of them, and then I'm going to loan them to a hive that's not doing well. I'm also going to take that top deep, shake all the bees out of it, and make sure definitely the queen stays in the bottom box, but I'm gonna take that deep, top deep box that's got lots of brood in it and honey, and I'm also gonna loan that to a weak hive so that it's just brood. That weak hive is gonna go up in there and take care of all that brood, and whoever hatches out becomes theirs. So I'm, I'm loaning that for a while, a few weeks, to another hive that needs to be boosted. So now what have I done is I've just shaken the entire population into one deep box. And as you can see, how well does it fit? Wow. I mean, it's packed. Now, the, the danger is that is ripe for swarming. Yeah. It's like they're going to say, it's a bit crowded here. We need to go. <laughs> um, but you're only going to do this for like two weeks. So it usually works. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it all down to that. And then I'm going to carefully put in a queen excluder, and then on top of the queen excluder, I'm gonna put one or two shallow boxes. These are really short boxes. And instead of having that wired wax foundation in the, in the frames, it's very, very thin, uh, not paper thin, but very, very thin, delicate wax in those shallow frames. Because what they're gonna do is they're, with that many bees on a flow, they're going to just be forced up through the, the queen excluder and get into those boxes of foundation. And they're going to just fill that up. And they could, they could fill those two boxes in two weeks. I mean, they'll just get on it. And really good comb honey has made fast and then taken off quickly before they track a bunch of dirt and uh, debris on it. So what you, what you want to see as a product 
is nice, clean, white, and I'm telling you, if they've got good forage, they can do this in just a matter of days. And so, so you, you want to make, you want to crowd them down, get them to make it fast, and then once you've made a couple boxes off, you don't want to keep it going because they will get into swarm mode. So once you, your two boxes or one box is full, pull it off and then take what you loaned out, shake all the bees out of that loaned equipment and bring it back. Put the original colony all back together, the, the mediums back on there and let them just go ahead and coast on through the summer, you know, bringing in their honey from different other sources. And uh, you've given a lot of room and so that they're like, oh, okay, it's not crowded so bad anymore. We can relax, we can not get into swarm mode. And uh, so you, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's a timing thing. You don't want to push them hard for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on end because then they will want to swarm and then you're going to be fussing and fighting with swarm urge. You just want to get in there, crowd them, make them produce this stuff real quick, pull it off, and then put it all back together and, and let them slow down. Uh, so do I do this in a particular time of year? I want to do it on a good flow. So uh, it just depends on where I'm at. So when you'll get to know when, when the bees are on a good flow. Number one, one thing you'll see is a lot of activity. Number two, you're going to start seeing as you go through your hives or your frames, you're going to start seeing all of a sudden there's like they're bringing in a lot of nectar. They're drying down a lot of nectar. Another thing that you're going to notice on a good flow is looking down between the uh, between the frames. You will see like they're putting white, fresh white wax everywhere. And when they start laying down a lot of wax and start building that comb out real fast, you know, okay, there's a lot of stuff coming in because uh, they're really getting urgent about putting it somewhere, and so they go into hyperactivity mode building comb and wax. So you'll look down in and you'll see, you'll see a lot of white burr comb, and, and between the frames there's a lot of wax buildup, and it's like, ooh, they're busy. Um, to make sure you stay ahead of that and put extra boxes on. So queens stay home. Uh, what, uh, what I'm doing in that whole entire process is I'm taking, like say, I'm taking my box, taking all the bees out of that and moving that. So it's just a box of brood that's moving around. When it, when it gets loaned out, there's no bees that go with it. When it comes back home, it's shook out and no bees come with it. So these bees stay here, those bees stay there. It's just, it's just the apartment that moves. So, I, yeah, I took the kitchen off this, or dining room, put it over there for a while, and then I took it back, like that. Okay, so there's another thing to consider. This is from the Canadian beekeeper guy. Is that nuts or what? Yeah. Look at that. Okay, so I was telling you yesterday about it's not unreasonable on a good, well-managed, strong hive to get three of those mediums. That's about 100 pounds of honey. He's running all deep equipment um, because he's got that lift. No, nobody lifts this stuff. He's using a lift. And um, he's also farming. And so he's got like 500 acres of canola right next to these bees. And so there's unlimited forage. So the point that I'm getting out with these two slides is there comes a point in time where you realize I can only get so much out of the natural landscape. If you really want to go into high production mode, <coughs> excuse me, um, you're going to have to start thinking about planting um, different crops to feed your bees. When you have your own control of crop forage for your bees, now you can really jack up the production. These hives, the way they're sitting right now, there's 300 pounds of surplus. 
honey in each one of those hives. Now do the math. 300 pounds. Okay, 1,000 pounds on every three hives that you see there. That's, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> um, that's just amazing. And so what, they're, what, they're, what they've done is these little, uh, you see these little spacers in here? So those are, are um, bee escapes. They only let the bees go down. So what they've done is this stack of four boxes was sitting on top of that, that bottom box. These are all full of canola honey. So what they did is they took their lift, they pulled it up, they put these two empty boxes on, they put this, uh, this escape in, and they left it like that for two or three days. And all the bees up here are going down in to the, the bottom part of the hive, and they're going to go crazy to fill these two boxes here that are empty. The queen is down here working in that bottom blue box. And then they're going to come back with their trucks in a couple of days, and they're going to strip all of these top four boxes off and take them into the, uh, uh, you know, their extraction process. It's going to take a couple of weeks. When this is right beside them, it's just going to, again, just take a few weeks. And they're going to fill up those bottom two boxes. Those are going to get stripped off. And in the end, he overwinters his bees in single deep, just like this. You watch his videos. He'll actually take all of his hives. He's running about 1,500 hives. But uh, he brings them all in to a shed and basically keeps them in the freezer from November to March. It's dark. It's cold. They don't get out. They just sit there mm, and do nothing for the winter. And he's got his rationale for doing that. It's, you, know, it's, you don't have to do that. But, but the idea is... Start looking at various cover crops. The clovers are usually a long season crop. There's a plant called Phasalia. He's got actually several videos where he does just of this kind of cover crop area that he does, in addition to his, uh, his canola that they grow uh, for the oil. Uh, he often gets like the borders of some of his property, and he will just plant a mix of clovers, sweet clover, white clover, there's red clover, there's crimson clover. Um, and he'll just plant a mix of these different crops just for his bees. Um, sunflower, he'll throw sunflowers in there too because the, the pollen on sunflowers is, is quite medicinal for the bees. It really does them good. So he's got uh, Physalia, which is another heavy produce, nectar producing plant, and sunflowers. So there's just lots of diversity and that diversity is really good for bees. Um, so, in the back of your mind, for you know, a few years down the road, you're going to think about, you know, do I have space that you know on my farm or maybe a neighbor's farm? And remember, if it's a half mile down the road, that's fine, right? Because the bees are going to forage out maybe a couple of miles. So even if it's down the road a ways, you know, if you can lease a field, uh, and it's very predictable how much honey per acre you can get from these various crops. You can look it up. And actually, if you go into Wikipedia and look this up, list of North American nectar sources, go all the way down to, you see these tabs? In the flower crops, herbs, and grasses, there's a, there's a chart there that's just really a fun chart to look at it. It gives the various plants and how well they produce nectar and how much honey per acre that those crops are capable of producing. And so you can really kind of get a really a good idea as to foraging plants that you could possibly think about planting in the future. And uh, not just relying on, I hope there's enough out there. You see what I'm saying? Going from that passive, letting your bees find whatever they can find to now I'm actively going to create honey forage for them. So that's a little bit more proactive. That's uh, something that you really want to want to be able to look towards. Is it true that they only harvest one thing at a time? So on some plants, the question is, do bees har harvest only one thing at a time? Yes, mostly. Bees, um, 
Oh, what's the word? Um, bees exhibit behavior called floral fidelity. So when they go out on a, on a nectar run, if they're going out to look around for a nectar source, once they find something that's good, they will only go to that one flower, that one type of flower. So if they go out and they find blackberry flowers that are, it's all in bloom, and they're gonna tank up on blackberries, they're gonna come home, they're gonna show it off, hey everybody, look, I'm getting a lot of forage over here, they're gonna recruit other bees, and as they do the, the dance, which don't have time to explain right now, telling all the other forage bees where to find it, they're giving them samples of the nectar they found. So the, the bees know not only where it is, it's, it's not only they're telling them the direction, but the distance in that dance. And then they're giving them sample. This is what it tastes and smells like. So when they get out there, they're gonna know just what it tastes and smells like. And they're just gonna hone right in and go right to that same crop. And they're gonna stay to th that crop until it's exhausted. Now, there might be other bees in the colony that have found something else, but they're just gonna go to that something else. And, you know, these bees have found that and they're gonna go there. And so you do have a mix as you go through the season, but yeah, they, they do express that floral fidelity when they're out and they do blackberries. They don't stop halfway home and hit some dandelions on the way. They don't do that. So. So think about planting and being proactive about that. Um, this is a really good site to become familiar with called scientificbeekeeping.com. Uh, this fellow here's name is Randy Oliver. He's a very big name in honeybee research and he lives just north of here, up in the hills of California. Uh, he has done a tremendous amount of research on, on mite control. He's developing a new method of mite control using oxalic acid soaked in shop towels. Um, so he's still developing it, and he's also working with the FDA to get that as a, an approved method. Once he gets it honed down and, and really effective, um, he's going to get certifications that the FDA will allow beekeepers to use oxalic acid in the form of a soaked shop towel. Uh, but a lot of other research that he does. It's really good academic reading uh, on that site, scientific beekeeping. Lots of good information there. Another subject I want to talk about, maybe that's a little more advanced, is not just, again, being passive and waiting around for somebody to call you, hey, I've got a swarm in my front yard. And so, okay, so you're going to go and, and take that swarm and drop it into your box. If you've got extra boxes sitting around, let's go trapping for bees. So what we can do is um, we can take our empty hive, spray a little bit of sugar water in it. That's not so, uh, that's not so important, but, but a little bit of lemongrass essential oil, like two or three drops spread around inside the hive. They really like that smell. And... Uh, and then take your, your boxes out, whether it's a nuke box, or like I, I told you guys yesterday, for a while I was making homemade boxes out of three, uh, three eighths plywood and one by twos. I'm getting those all out of my, hi my production hives because they won't fit on these double bases and I'm turning those into swarm traps. So I've got about 30 or so of these little nukes and I'll have about 30 of, of those homemade boxes that I'll drop frames into. And you see the little hole in the front of the box there. And I've set it up on a root wad. Both of these collected really good swarms. That was, it worked really well. But what you're gonna do on the swarm trapping for really good ex, uh, success is use old comb. That old comb that's been drawn out and it's starting to darken up because they've used it so much, it just smells. And bees can smell that stuff a mile away. It just smells like home. So that's going to attract them. You can use a nuke or a full deep body. You want a small entrance. Bees cue in on a fairly large space behind a small entrance. 
They want a small entrance because they want something that's easy to guard. See what I'm saying? They, want this, they, they don't want this great big old gaping hole in front. You want it 12, you know, 6 to 12 feet off the ground. Oftentimes, just uh, you know, about 8 feet up in a tree. Or I've, I get all my friends that uh, you know, I can talk into this. And I'll just simply put a box up on top of a shed or a barn roof or something like that, a lean-to. And just get it you know, up off the ground. They like that. Often south facing is really nice too. Um, at the borderline, like right at the border of some forest and some field, have, <clears throat> you know, you could just uh, bungee it or, or screw it up in a tree facing the field, facing south or whatever. You see what I'm saying? On a, on a transition in the landscape is often good places. The edge of woods, buildings, roof, uh, root wads, etc. A little bit of lemongrass essential oil. And think about this one. I just realized because. This uh, nuke box here, I had that at Nathan's place, and that's about 10 feet up in, in this tree. And when I put it up there, it was really light. I could just hold that box under my arm and climb the tree. And I just climbed it up there, and, and I just screwed it to the side of the tree. When it came to get it down, that thing weighs like 30 pounds, because it's, I didn't realize they moved in there. And they were in there for a few weeks before I noticed. It's like, oh, there's bees in there. They had it so drawn out and packed with honey that it was really heavy. And it's like, if you drop one of those, it's going to be like a nuclear bomb. <laughs> OK, you don't want to drop these things. But they're heavy. So think about when you're putting it up there, you're going to have to get it down. And it might weigh a lot. So make sure you think through the, you know, the logistics of ladder um, and a ladder in such a way that you can get this big bulky thing down. So just kind of think that through. I learned that's the lesson the hard way. No, I didn't. <laughs> Could you It's not a good idea. You, when you get them down, you want it close to nighttime when they're all home, and then you can just close it up. They're all there, and then take it away. Bungee it or, or strap it, and then uh, just very carefully take it home wherever it's going to wind up. Another thing that uh, really works well, and it's uh, you, you see this product in that Dayton catalog that uh, uh, I let you guys take uh, yesterday. Uh, Man Lake, which is another really good supplier uh, throughout the, the country. Man Lake will also sell this. Now, this is about an ounce. It's called Swarm Commander. Costs about $35 or so for an ounce. Now, if you collect one colony, do you see how quickly you've paid for this? Because when you collect a colony that just comes and finds you, that's like $200 bills flying through the air and landing in your mailbox. Is that a good thing? Would you spend $35 making $200? That's good business. So, uh, and so I was sitting in my truck. I had just gotten this stuff, and it's like, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, all I got to do is collect one swarm on it. And it just takes like, like two little sprays in one of these boxes. That's all you need. And you know an ounce, so it's got like a hundred little sprays in it. So I'm sitting there in my truck in my driveway, and I just set it out on the uh, the rearview mirror of my truck. And within minutes, you see that bee? <laughs> he just like, oh, what do you got here? What's this? <laughs> he just comes around. He actually lands on the bottle and walks around and just kind of smells good. It's it's kind of like cologne, makes them. It really attracts them well. So that's something else that does, uh, it is worth its, its price. A little bit expensive, but you know, it's OK. Um, another thing to think about is hive removal services. After you learn about bees, you understand the biology, you understand the, the, just the whole makeup of the hive and the mechanics of what happens in there. This is how 
So I got to about year six in my, in my bee raising, and I, one winter, I had 10 hives, and I lost half of them. And uh, so then it's like, okay, that means I got to buy five packages. Well, that's like almost $500 back then. It's like, no, I'm too cheap for that. So I started contacting all the pest control businesses in town and gave them my name as somebody who will take honeybees. At first, it's just a tr um, going out and collecting swarms, but later it became actual extractions. Now, this is not for everybody, but if you have the ability to understand construction and like what's going on behind that wall, you gotta have a concept of plumbing, you need to have a little bit of an understanding of wiring, so that when it comes to the point where you need to cut open in a wall, you're not gonna be like cutting into wires and stuff like that. You really kinda have to understand how things are made. But uh, this is really a viable way to get extra bees w as well. And what makes this kind of fun is, number one, every one of them is different, so it's an adventure. Number two, you get paid three ways. The people will pay you to get, the, you know, because it's a service to them. So, so they pay me to get rid of the bees. Number two, I get the bees, and if I take care of them responsibly and efficiently, those bees will give me a honey crop the next year. So I've got to keep them alive, so that's on me. And then the other thing, too, is primarily what I'm doing is only taking the brood out of this wall and putting it in my hive. Um, all of the surplus honey that's in that wall gets put in a bucket and brought home and squeezed out, extracted, put in jars, and sold at the next farmer's market. So I'm selling the honey, I'm getting the bees, which produce um, you know, an income on their own, and then somebody's paying me to do all that. So that's really a nice thing to do. Uh, one of the best guys out there, he's just a really fun guy to watch, is JP the Bee Man. He lives down in Alabama. Um, Alabama or Lu uh, Alabama? Louisiana, I think. Anyway, he's down south, and that is kind of his business. He's got gobs and gobs of videos on YouTube of extracting bees out of just about everything you could possibly extract a bee out of. And believe me, these bees will find the craziest, craziest places to get into. I mean, a hole like this big. It's like, how do you guys find that? And get up into the eaves of a house that has a soffit and it's just a, a little hole and a big empty space behind it. And that's what they want. So they'll get in there and, and of course, people freak out and panic and call me. So, okay, so do I offer the repair? Okay, I try to go into this situation with the, with, the, with the knowledge of I'm the beekeeper. I'm here to solve your beekeeping problem. I will open up and clean out. Now, with all that bee smell in there, I will guarantee you, customer, that there will be more bees very shortly that will want to come back into here. So it's your job to find a, you know, a carpenter or somebody who will, who will fill that void with insulation or something because I'm gonna scrape out every bit of comb and wax that I can because I'm also getting a whole surplus crop of beeswax too, right? So that's actually a fourth product that I'm getting out of this deal. But I try to set it up where I'm going in, I'm opening and getting the bees. And it's your job to find somebody to repair and close up. There are some older people, some people that just don't have the capacity to deal with, with that. And I'm like, okay, you know, for an hourly wage, I will close it all up and deal with it. But I try not to do that. Um, just because I'm so busy doing other stuff, I, you know, I just want to skim off the bees and... Uh, deal with the bees. But he's, this guy's got some really fun videos on, on extracting bees. And uh, so he's, he's fun to watch. Uh, how are we doing for time? When does, this, when does this class end? In how many minutes? You're saying three? Well, okay, so what, what's... 
10, 15. Okay, so just a couple of minutes. Perfect. Okay, so here are a list of some of the guys, uh, some of the uh, people that I'll watch on YouTube. Uh, the Canadian beekeeper, I watch him all the time. I'm subscribed to him. JP the Bee Man is, is more just really fun watching, but you will learn stuff about every case that he gets into is just totally different. Now, how am I going to get the bees out of this one? And so you start learning about how to approach these problems on, on extracting. Bob Binney is another commercial, uh, commercial beekeeper, very soft-spoken man, but just profound knowledge. And the way he does things is so simple. He's just fun to listen to, but he's, he's like the Canadian guy. He's running several thousand hives. Um, 628 Dirt Rooster, he's kind of a fun guy. Look up 625 Dirt Rooster, biggest swarm in the world, or something like that. Um, he <laughs> this is crazy. He collected a swarm that was just right next to a whole commercial operation, and the swarm was literally about like as big around as you three ladies to me, wow. hanging in a tree. I mean, it. Now, this did not all come out of one hive. What happens is you'll get a swarm in a, near a commercial yard where there's like hundreds and hundreds of hives. You'll get a swarm that leaves. And because there's so many thousands of bees flying around, they will all like, they're coming home with a load of whatever. And it's like, a queen. <laughs> where are we going? And so it will become a super swarm and it will mass in this gigantic things. And sometimes there will be two queens in there, uh, a virgin queen, an older queen. But anyway, so he and his buddies, they took their pickup truck and had two deeps entire the back end of his truck, two deeps. And they put a, a queen cage. Uh, you know, they just happened to have like, like 30 queens. And they put a queen in every one of those boxes. And then they brought it underneath. And they threw a rope over and they shook this whole entire ball of like 100 pounds of bees just down onto the truck. And it was kind of a fun video. But he's got a lot of interesting stuff. Michael Palmer, he's in the East Coast. Um, really good presentations on um, National Honey Show. He's, he's done some really good videos. So look up Michael Palmer. He's got some really neat stuff. Randy Oliver, I told you about uh, scientificbeekeeping.com. Jason Chrisom, he's got some good information. He's just kind of a country bumpkin guy. Uh, barnyard bees, uh, the guy who does barnyard, I can't remember his name, but he does a lot of production. He makes a lot of queens and nukes, and he sells nukes. Devin Ron, he's kind of a, he's kind of a country living type guy. Uh, okay, Cornell beekeeping, I have to put that in because I graduated from uh, the Cornell Master Beekeeper program, and the, so you look up Dice Lab, Honey Bee, and they've got some really good videos about walkaway splits and just various care for your hives. And also National Honey Show Channel has just a lot of really good information, uh, uh, lots of different facets of, of beekeeping and, and good programs, presentations from around the world um, through their program. So that's a list. That'll keep you busy for a long, long time. So. Let me, I know it's, it's in between class time, but uh, there's one difference on this hive as I've got it set up here. So you notice what I've done here is I've stapled little straps on either side of this, this base so that I can, bun, so I can strap this down and move it without it falling apart. My lids. You notice these aren't the regular telescoping lids. These are what are called migratory lids. They're, they drop over the front and back, but not the sides, because they're, they're side by side, right this, right? And then if you also notice, this has got that plug that I was talking to you about. So that's how I feed. When I'm not feeding, I keep this plug in, and they will propolize it and seal it off. But when I need to feed, just pop this out, put the bucket on. The other thing that's different about this lid is it's got a spacer around so it doesn't sit flat against the bottom. And then instead of a wood inner cover, I've got a foamy, what we call foamy. It's just this foam thing. And that really does insulate the bees quite well. 
So I've got that on there. And it's way cheap. This is like 50 cents if you buy a whole roll of it um, versus spending $10, $12 on a, a wood inner cover. That just becomes really handy, easy to do that. It's simple, and it's a more manageable package as somebody who's got a lot of bees. Do you do that for winter storage? So, so yes, I, I winter store like this as well. And then, of course, I, I do, do two different colors on the entrance. So, you know, blue bees, which are this side, really cue in on the blue. And, you know, if they're thinking, okay, I'm a, I'm a blue home bee, it's, it's a lot harder for them to walk into the yellow side because they are close together. So they kind of separate themselves so that do you, way. Do you keep your bees like that or in general, or that's a nice rotation? No, this is, this is what all of my bees are going into now. So all of my hives are in pairs, and, and this is the way I'm doing pretty much everything now. I've come to this point. Yes? Yeah, it's always in there. So that, yeah, that inner cover is always there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you for coming. And uh, these are the standard size Langstroth hives. So, you know, and again, uh, in, in the summertime, I've built up, I've got the two deeps, and then I've got the, the mediums, honey supers up here. So, you know, it'll just be two hives side by side. You said when you, you wax your foundation, mm -hmm. do you use your own wax? Yes, I do. Okay. As, uh, when you extract, you, you get a lot of very clean wax that you melt down, um, s run it through a cheesecloth or something to extract all the little gritties out of there, and, and uh, it just becomes a real nice source for beeswax. Foul brood, no. A foul brood is something totally different. I mean, that's a subject in and of itself, so just do a lot of reading on foul brood. It's not that common, but know how to deal with it when it, you do get it. So, so at one point in time I did, but I'm getting away from homemade stuff just because the tolerances, the spaces are all very particular. So I just, you know, I get commercially made equipment. Let them do the fuss. How much honey do they need in their hives to do the long term? Um, for where I live, 30 or 40. No, no, more, more than that. 40 or 50 pounds. 40 to 60 pounds. I'd like to see the 60 pound. Um, more than less, but uh, OK. Um, where do you get that silvery stuff? Home Depot. Yeah. 